Impact India. My name is uh, Sara Iqbal. I'm the convener of SciCom Think Labs and, uh, and a science engagement consultant based in New Delhi. And I'm, I'm quite delighted to be the moderator for two very interesting discussions that we'll be having over the next one and a half hours. Um, before we dive into today's uh, discussion, let me briefly introduce the structure of, uh, of this uh, session. Uh, we'll have the discussion uh, where we'll unpack the findings and recommendations of the SciCom Think Labs report, followed by a broader discussion on beyond the status quo, unlocking the potential of science communication and public engagement in India. Um, we would also request you to please drop your questions or comments uh, during the course of, of this webinar, and we'll, we'll, take, we'll take, the, take them up. Um, my my uh, wonderful colleague uh, and the invisible support behind today's webinar, Utsav uh, Thapriyal, told me there's a feature of upvoting questions. So if you know what that means, uh, please go ahead and do that uh, so that we can then prioritize the questions that are, are coming to us. Um, and uh, so Fast India, for those of you who are not aware of, uh, is a, is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing policy and program solutions to strengthen I think uh, Sarah could have like lost a bit of her connection, but um, yes, she's just coming back on. But till that time, at least I can give a brief about Fast India. So it's a nonprofit institution which is dedicated to building uh, some capacity and advancing policy solutions within India, right? And we work with like a variety of stakeholders in India to develop and strengthen the science ecosystem. Uh, and uh, we are advancing scientific research and we are also hoping to translate it into some economic values and social good. Uh, we have like at Fast India, we have like five key verticals, which are policy and research, government support, institutional strengthening, corporate sector engagement and science communication. Uh, and uh, then the SciCom Think Labs uh, report is uh we are launching the report here today with all of you and uh we are here uh to basically discuss what happened like what culminated uh in the psychom think labs and what has uh, what have we uh produced as outputs in the science communication space in india right uh so here you can see like uh, that there were a few problems that we were trying to solve through the psychom think labs initiative right uh, there were absence of suitable forums for strategic dialogue among professionals and key stakeholders. Then there's a lack of concrete roadmap, including clarity on roles and benchmarks. And then there's lack of Indian perspective, literature and evidence based on science communication and public engagement. Uh, so just a yeah. little brief about... So the... I'm back. Okay. Yes, Sarah's yeah. back. All so right. sorry. I think what's a webinar without any technical hitches. Uh, I'm so sorry for that uh, technical hitch. But thank you so much, Utsa, for uh, filling in. Um, uh, like Utsa was saying, um, you know, and, and, and Fast India, you know, central to Fast India's mission is science communication and public engagement. And those of you who've been following Fast and its work uh, would also know that Fast organizes an annual science festival and has an India Science Fe uh, Book Fellowship both aimed at promoting science among young people and the general public. So on very similar lines, FAST also felt that there is a need to uh, look at what are you know, problems in the field of science communication and public engagement. And, and that's really how uh, SciCom Think Labs came about. And, and also, you know, while we see that science communication and public engagement is gaining attention in our country, um, institutions and organizations um, are hiding science communicators. We have a dedicated chapter in the latest uh, science technology and innovation policy uh, on science communication and uh, you know public engagement. But we continue to really grope in the dark, not knowing exactly what we are doing, where we are headed, and and I guess this is to some extent as what you know Utsav was was mentioning is because we don't have a lot of platforms with such strategic uh, focused discussions can happen. We also don't currently have any clear roadmaps um, or you know, resources that we can use to uh, build the ecosystem. And, and I think this is where SciCom Think Labs came in and, and to provide that much needed pause we need uh, to reflect and think more strategically about the gaps that exist in the ecosystem and also to develop actionable ideas and, and recommendations. And uh, who better to 
think about what needs to be done other than the practitioners and researchers in the field itself and uh, you know who have first hand experience and understanding of the field so psychom think labs uh, was formed as a community led group that would examine the current state of science communication in india in order to develop actionable roadmaps recommendations and frameworks for streamlining the space uh, the initiative not only looked at the current landscape of science communication practice but also uh, at pathways uh, to build capacity in science communication to strengthen institutional science communication uh, and we'll hear about all of that uh, you know in the discussion uh, um, in just a bit. And uh, to look into these themes, um, we, uh, you know, Psycom Think Labs brought together about uh, 16 science communication and engagement professionals that you can see on the screen right now, who would, uh, you know, over a course of six to seven months, uh, co-created um, and brainstorm, you know, strategies and frameworks and, and recommendations that can be actioned. Uh, and four of them uh, will be in this discussion uh, very shortly. So over the past year, Psycom Think Labs has journeyed through a series of learning and knowledge sharing sessions, uh, in-depth research phases, and also strategic discussions, one of which uh, was Psycom Huddle at the India Science Festival. And this timeline, as you see here, is you know really just shows the key milestones uh, from the formation of the working groups uh, almost you know more than a year ago uh, to the synthesis of actionable recommendations which is really the report uh, and the resources that we are releasing today uh, to really kind of bring us a step closer to a cohesive and more transformative roadmap for SciComm and public engagement. And uh, the, this, all this work has really you know, resulted in a report that uh, you know, we'll be sharing in the chat in just a bit and also obviously on our website and social media. Uh, we've also been very fortunate when we started on this journey to have the support of experts like uh, you know the ones you see on on the screen who bring in very diverse um, experience and and provided very uh, you know uh, practical and 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 wise advice to us uh, throughout the throughout the course of this process and uh, to 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 help us unpack this short yet uh, you know insightful journey of uh, think labs uh, i would like to invite my colleagues uh, who, who were involved in different working group groups uh, to take us through some of the key ideas and recommendations that were generated by the four different working groups. Uh, the first one looked at uh, the, the, the landscape of science communication practice. The second group working group looked at uh, the science communication that's happening at institutions, what's needed, what's missing. Uh, the third group looked at capacity building in science communication, what sort of training um, and other professional uh, courses need to be developed. And uh, the fourth group looked at science and media, uh, the, the connect between science and media, with media you know, being an imp important actor and important stakeholder in, in, in science uh, communication and public engagement. And as you can see, we, we really touched upon a, a very wide canvas and, and you know, the ideas that have also come from uh, such analysis is also uh, some of it is is directly applicable, but some of it some of it actually gives us food for thought and and directions for what needs to be done going forward. Uh, so I think to kind of bring all of this together, uh, perhaps more coherently than what I have done uh, just now, uh, I would like request Siddharth Kankaria, uh, Sundatta Karak, uh, Shuli Mitra, uh, Devdatta Paul uh, to to please come in and let's uh, let's discuss a bit about what we've been up to over the last one year. So first of all, thank you all for, for uh, joining us. And uh, also we can maybe uh, stop sharing the screen. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, we will spend the next uh, 30 minutes or so uh, just discussing what uh, you know all of us have learned over, over this uh, period. So you know, let's just, let's just drum, uh, jump straight into our discussion. So the first question to all of you is, you know, what new insights did your research as part of Think Labs provided, given that some of you have been in, in the space for a while? Uh, were there any findings that really surprised you or shifted your perspective? And also, do you think there were any pre-existing observations or notions that were validated by this work? Of course, when we all got together, there were certain hypotheses that we had and, and those were set into motion. And I think that's, we use that to design, our, uh, design the, the work. So yeah, if you could maybe uh, come in one by one and share your thoughts on these three questions. Uh, so Shuli, can I request you to go first and then we'll take it from there. Thanks, Sarah. Um, the advantage of going first is I have a lot of points with me, right? <laughs> so um, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I, 
I think I speak for a lot of people over here when I say that I wasn't particularly surprised with the findings that uh, of the research that we had. Um, so we did a survey, uh, conducted interviews, and nothing was very surprising. But there was a lot of validation, and uh, I am particularly, uh, as a group, we were particularly um, impressed with the fact that there is a lot of recognition for formal training. Although close to, I think, 70% practitioners right now are do not have a formal degree in science communication, we would, uh, we all recognize how important that is. The second thing that I was really, uh, I, I would like to bring in over here is that uh, the extent that mandates and interests of host organizations have over the uh, influence of uh, over the structure of these courses. So findings like this are very important for how we design our courses. Uh, I would I had expected that there would be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, lot of conversations about challenges in regional science communication that did not happen. So there is some motivation about ramping up this survey across institutions and to have regional chapters to, you know, uh, there were a few participants who did voice that uh, perspective, but I would have expected more. So. Uh, uh, and there was, uh, when we looked at different uh, career levels, the diversity of training needs expanded. For instance, uh, students, PhD students had a strong preference for training in popular science writing or digital content creation. But when we moved towards the higher, uh, higher levels of career and uh, interviewed senior scientists, they were more interested uh, in being trained in public or stakeholder engagement. Mm. So I'll, uh, I think I'll stop there. And no. uh, yeah, thank you so much, Julia. And I think it's important that we do these sort of studies when we're developing courses or professional training for science communication. Uh, we do a need analysis and and you know one size will not fit all so i think this sort of an analysis was very helpful so uh, that's uh, working group three chapter we'll, we'll be able to find out a lot more about what uh, the working group three did thank you so much julie so that can i bring you in next uh, to talk a bit about you know your the landscape study you did on science communication practice along with the working group yeah. members <clears throat> yeah uh, thanks a lot, Sarah, Utsav, and Pastor India for having me here. Wonderful to be here and see friendly faces again. Uh, so our group was was not really sort of geared towards looking at a particular question, but we wanted to create a baseline of what science communication practitioners and activities and expectations, needs, context are. So our group really wanted to sort of capture sort of the, the diversity of science communication happening across the country. Uh, and, and we thought that having this baseline was very critical for building on and answering any sort of questions in the future uh, about science communication in India. And we realized that there wasn't any comprehensive national sort of baseline of what SciComm in India looks like, right? Yeah. So I think our group basically, if I can share a little bit of context, our group looked at six verticals, which were different kinds of functions of science communication, what were the context in which audiences were situated within different regions and, and contexts within India. Uh, we looked at what kind of scientific content was being communicated across the country and were there any differences in that. We also looked at what kind of channels or mediums or formats people preferred using. Was there a preponderance of one channel over the other? And we also looked at language within the same vertical. Uh, then one, one of the things that I'm, I keep talking about a lot is evaluation and assessment. So we also looked at whether science communicators were actually looking at impact assessment of whether their activities were actually making a difference, whether they're being successful, are there things that they need to work on further? And the last thing we looked at, was, which was overlapping with working group three, was to look at what kind of training context and needs were there, right? So right. if I can quickly highlight two or three things that you know caught my attention. Uh, I think some things were very obvious and we were not surprised. Uh, there was about a six, uh, sort of 1.5 is to one ratio of women to men. And, we, and I think by experience, we do find a lot more women in science communication, which is expected. Um, a lot of people, about 60% of the science communicators we interviewed said that they learned actually on the job and only 15% of them had formal training. Uh, there was a, a sort of over-reliance on 
science communication functions which talked about spreading awareness or education or doing institutional public relations and there was much less public engagement much less uh, dealing with misinformation or busting misinformation or dealing with sort of more participatory methods and these were not surprising at all because by anecdotal evidence we we expected all of this uh, we also found that most of the science communication was geared towards audiences and students uh, audiences like students and scientists and there was le- very less focus on science communication which was targeted towards more marginalized or minoritized communities uh, and this again was not con- uh, surprising in terms of content i think there is again a bias towards biology physics uh and tech related information and even medicine and health related information whereas things like climate change astronomy uh talking about stem processes and institutions were actually far lesser again this was not surprising we also found a bias towards more english uh, science communication happening in english and not in other languages and clearly there is a need and a demand for doing more regional and vernacular language science communication uh, and the last bit about training was that about 80% people uh had never used evaluation methods in science communication but 75% of them actually expressed an interest in learning how to use these methods so those are a short summary of our findings and and I'll stop with that thank you that's very helpful thank you so much sadat and uh this uh, to to un- to learn more about i think the survey that uh, working group one did and and the insights and um you know uh, be- the baseline Uh, scenario or in science communication practice i think please refer to working group one chapter and uh, the link to the report will be shared i think shortly um, you can then take a look at that so thank you for that siddharth that was really helpful uh, sundarta can i request you to go next and share your groups learning thanks so. sara uh, and thanks to fast india for bringing us all together i'm representing here the working group that worked on understanding institutional science communication one of the folk, I mean, one of the reasons why we thought that this is an area worth looking at is because in india currently a lot of science communication primarily happens through institutions um so what and and it also so happens that the members of this group Uh, were largely all the first time pe- and people who were hired as science communicators by their institutions for the very first time so we had our own personal experiences shaping a lot of our um questions that we wanted to ask um we reached out to other science communicators in other institutes as well and what we understood by reaching out to them and also introspecting among our groups are some of these things uh, so in india historically some institutes have focused on science communication for the reason of reaching out to society for myth busting uh, for developing something what in india we call as developing a scientific temper and in the recent times uh, people, some institutes have started using tools of communication to for image building for the sake of uh, raising raising grants or uh, getting better talent particularly undergraduate uh student focused institutions have been doing this but at the same time i mean when we also uh, looked more into existing literature some from fast india itself we realized that science communication actually can be placed very centrally to many activities of the institute um it could be uh, in alliance with very uh traditional offices in our institutes which are called as pme or if i have to expand on it it's called planning monitoring and evaluation or research development offices in some other places grants offices academic offices or even directors offices um while science communication can actually work in alliance with all these different offices often times many of us have also felt very isolated and solitary in our positions uh without having the power of um working with them i mean many of us have gone through that um and that's because the positions pr- probably at which people were hired didn't empower them enough and uh, that is also a point where i should tell you that uh, people were hired at a diversity of uh, i mean the names of these positions were diverse it could mm-hmm. range from something like project associate to scientific and technical officers to consultants mm-hmm. to um scientists uh, some institutes have actually just given it given the roles of science communication to their existing scientists themselves right. so doing science communication for them is really not the top priority so there is a huge diversity that exists we feel that um, india is still at a position where we have started hiring institutional science communicators but we yeah. still don't have the road map 
uh, to to empower them properly, not right. only for their own professional development, but also for the institute to uh, capitalize on this capacity entirely. And that I think is going to be a core focus for the institutions in the next few years. Great, very helpful. Thank you so much, Samzata. I think there's a lot that needs to happen at the institutional level. Like as you said, that that's probably uh, a key actor that communicates science and makes ac science accessible to a large uh, number of people. Um, Dibdata, can I request you to talk a bit about Science and Media Working Group and what did you guys find out? Yes, thank you, Sarah. So uh, we worked on um, trying to understand the relationship between scientists, science scientific institutions, and uh, journalists, professional science journalists. And uh, first of all, we had two different surveys aimed at different uh, audiences. One was for scientists and science communicators, press officers in scientific institutions, and the other for journalists. So we were a little surprised uh, to answer your question to find that some of these answers from different perspectives sort of converged to tell one coherent story. Even with a smaller number of responses, uh, we felt validated that we could do this process. We, we didn't have a lot of uh, statistics, but uh, there was some level of validation that we got from the process. Uh, we generally found out that there is a general misunderstanding between scientists and journalists, and this is not surprising. There is some uh, level of suspicion of, and, and not understanding what the other person's role is. Um, but at the same time, we figured that uh, there is also a good faith approach where people are willing to take that extra step if given the logistical framework to do it and, uh, you know, uh, having more more access to networks for journalists, more access to papers, and scientists and scientists, scientists time uh, from their uh, busy schedules. So this is something we figured that if the, the work that uh, we could do going ahead was uh, to solve the logistical barriers that we have, that we figured uh, where the barriers uh, primarily, uh, not the value uh, issues uh, that we come across, broadly that could solve most of the problems and that could be a road ahead. Uh, so that was to summarize our finding yeah. that there is a step ahead that we can take. Great. And and Devdatta, while you're at this and you say that you got, that your working group particularly also came up with possible ways to address the, the problem uh, or the logistical issue that you said, uh, are, are there any recommendations uh, from from your working group that you that you would really like to see action? And, yes. Uh, Yes, thanks for the question again. Uh, so uh, we have proposed a roadmap for the uh, science media uh, residency program, which uh, would like to, you know, we have asked this question to everybody that we have surveyed, scientists, press officers, and journalists, and everybody uh, seems to be on the on the uh, side of um, having, a, having a concrete framework for journalists to be able to reside in scientific institutions, have the access to scientists, their libraries, journals, and uh, people's time. And this could help a lot of the uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions that sort of create uh, these uh, sus suspicion or uh, misunderstanding of, of uh, each other's professions that we come across quite often. So this is one framework. And the other one we quickly I'd like to mention that we sort of uh, explored was a portal or, or a, a channel to have uh, science stories from all institutions in India at one place, something that exists, uh, something like that exists along uh, in, in the not uh, global north, but maybe something like that contextualized to the Indian core, Indian uh, ecosystem would help the, uh, uh, you know, the process as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Devdatta. So there's a science uh, journalist residency framework that's also uh, has, there's a QR link in the report. So you can scan it or click on the link and it will take you to the residency report. And it's very comprehensive and outlines some very, I think, forward looking uh, ideas there of how you can bridge the gap between science and media scientists and media scientific institutions and media. Uh, so thank you, Devdatta, for, for that. Um, actually, so I, I think I'll extend the same question to all of you. So Siddharth, so what do you think any recommendations or any any, any sort of learnings uh, from the baseline or the landscaping work that Working Group 1 did on science communication practice that, that you think there are certain recommendations or, or way forward that you may want right. to pursue? So I think the first and most obvious recommendation is that we need to do this on a more larger scale. So we did it at a very small sample size of about 60 people. Uh, and I think for, for a starting pilot study, it was great, but I think we really need 
a lot more data points across the country, uh, specifically in underrepresented regions. So that's one thing. The second thing is that we really need more documentation and surveying or SICOM happening outside big urban cities and big institutions like TFR, ISC and stuff. So there's really a need for also looking at more community, more traditional, more folk, more regional, more vernacular SICOM practices. And I would also like to highlight at this point that even though science communication as an organized field has only come about in India in the last one or two decades, science communication as a practice has been in India for a very long time, right? And right. for example, the people science movements or a lot of things that have happened uh, even after independence, but also before independence have always been there, right? Yes. Uh, so I think there is a very much a need for sort of documenting and learning from these because it's very easy to look at the West and try to ape it and try to copy it and see that, oh, we are going to adopt these things, which I think there are lots of learnings there and we should definitely look at those. But it's also equally important to understand that what works for our country, for our context, uh, doesn't always have to be an adaptation of the West. It can also be looking at our past and creating de novo sort of uh, context and opportunities and frameworks and formats that work for us, right? So yeah. that's definitely something we can do. Uh, I think from our baseline survey, we really saw that there was a lot of thirst for more training needs. And I think in India, there hasn't been a very sort of structured science communication training course. There are short workshops for a few days and maybe even short courses, but there is a scope for actually creating a, a more standardized uh, sort of science communication training course, which is, again, based in India, conducted in India, conducted by people in India, rather than getting people from outside. Right? Yeah. So that's one thing that I would say. Uh, so continuous professional development. But at the same time, there's a lot of knowledge exchange opportunities that we can learn from other countries across the world, not just the global north, but also global south. And there is a lot of partnerships and ways to work together where we can actually create more than the sum of our parts as, as yeah. uh, we can do, yeah. right? So yeah, I'll start with that. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you. Uh, Sundata, uh, what about institutional science communication? Yeah, we would really like to recommend that institutions have to start thinking about science communication as their core capacity. And in order to do that, it's uh, important to first think of science communication beyond just a help for the institutional leadership. And institutional leadership at the same time, of the senior members of the institution need to be clear on why do they want to start science communication in their respective institutes, chart out their goals, hire people accordingly, pay them with parity. In, I mean, it has to be consistent with the other pays that happen in the institute. Uh, it also is important that, I mean, a lot of young people today want to consider this as a possible career track, but to be able to attract and retain talent they will need to empower the science communicators to design and execute, execute their own projects, collaborate with other departments in the institute or outside the institute as well, have funding mechanisms, have possibilities of their own professional development consistently and networking. And, and, and the possibility of building a team eventually. I mean, a lot of our institutes are just hiring one person. And from that one person, we expect so much. I mean, we expect things of, PR to communications to high level discussions. And that is practically not going to work out. Uh, but while it is okay for an institute to probably start out that way, but eventually they need to have mechanisms of building a team. That's it. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Sundata. Shuli? On capacity yes. building, I think Siddharth has touched upon it, but would be yes. nice for you to elaborate. Uh, so I'll just continue with the thread that uh, Siddharth started about, you know, content. Uh, India, uh, science communication in India has had its own history and journey. And, you know, there have been learnings. Um, and I think we need, when we are, for instance, teaching those theoretical models of science communication, we need to embed those experiences while teaching that. That is going to be very important. We have, uh, as a group, come up with a framework. So uh, there are many courses. There have been many courses at different times, and they have some of them stopped for uh, uh, reasons of funding, sustainability. And what needs to be also done is to have a more uh, adaptive framework. And right now, it's uh, it will be uh, open for everyone. What we have been able to do is look at what is done globally and what is 
what might work for India. And then uh, we have been able to identify certain core and specialized elements to go into the framework. What can be done by institutions, both research and academic institutions, is they can take this framework. And if you are teaching uh, a course, you can adapt this into a two week workshop and you can also adapt it uh, into a two month uh, credit course. Right now, uh, DBT DST courses have PhD students who uh, go through courseworks and they have credit courses on science writing, science communication. They name it differently. Yeah. What they can do is uh, use this framework to design those. What uh, we would also recommend is to have a diversity in train uh, in trainers. Uh, scientists are already burdened with the work that they do. Mm -hmm. So they uh, and then this is an additional job of also teaching something they might not themselves be trained in. So it would be uh, prudent to uh, have faculty exchanges yeah. for these courses. Uh, there are both global and national experts available, and uh, some of them are over here in this room. They can be reached out for connecting uh, with experts. And I think, uh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, all of you. And uh, the resource that Shuli mentioned uh, is, uh, again, a framework that Working Group 3 has developed uh, of uh, a modular, customizable framework for designing science communication courses. Um, and it, it, like like Shuri mentioned, it can be customized for audience, for uh, duration, and for needs. So uh, again, a uh, link to the to this framework is available in the report, and, and you can have a look at it. And of course, you know, all of us are really um, also very keen to hear your thoughts and your suggestions for all these outputs that we have uh, put together. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you on that. Uh, from Working Group uh, 2, which is the Institutional Science Communication, we have uh, developed a science communication uh, readiness level for institutions. So how ready are institutions for science communication? So we've uh, developed a very handy, um, uh, handy tool for institutions to assess their readiness level when it comes to science communication. And that, again, a link to that is available in the report. Um, the surveys that Siddharth and Dittata and Shuli mentioned are also uh, available in the, in the report, links to that. So in case anybody is interested, you know, feel free to use those survey tools. Uh, they're very comprehensive. They're very, very well th thought out and I think can be used uh, by, you know, more widely. So please feel free to use that as well. Okay, so one final question before I let you all go, uh, but hope you'll stay for the next discussion is, uh, you know, uh, what do you think as practitioners in, in science communication or researchers in science communication, how can we as a community become more than the sum of our parts to advance this field in the country? I think there are pockets of excellence, there are pockets of you know, uh, resources, but how can we all, you know, really come together and make science communication bigger than uh, what it is now? So just very quick thoughts, final thoughts from all of you. Uh, that doesn't have to be related to SciComm Think Labs, could be from where you are currently based and your experiences. So um, Siddharth, can I invite you first, perhaps? Um, all right. So I think we're at a stage in India in science communication where we really need to question the relationship of science communication with science and scientific institutions. I think so far, uh, and I'm very grateful for it, that mostly scientific institutions have been sort of the epicenters or the catalyzers of science communication. But I think it's time to move science communication from being institution-centric to being community-centric, right? And that doesn't mean that we stop working with institutions. It just means that we need to really bring in more stakeholders into this conversation. And I think um, this relationship of science uh, and science communication being sort of taking the outputs of science and really conveying it to is sort of becoming old and we really need to also start seeing science communication as a site for knowledge production, not just knowledge sharing. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that we blurred the boundaries between creating knowledge, which is seen as scientist's job and sharing knowledge, which is seen as science communicator's job and really start blurring, which means that scientists do more science communication, but also science communicators start doing more active research and it doesn't always have to be scientific research it can also be sociological research right yeah. because we are actually doing experiments every day in the field with all kinds of people and trying to figure out what works best for which community and how best to communicate 
this knowledge or information we want to share, right? So I don't see the difference between this binary between scientist and science communicator needs to be blurred a little bit. I mean, there is value in having them as separate roles, of course, but I really think that it's time for us to start blurring these boundaries a little bit. Great, great thought. Thank you for sharing that, Siddharth. Devdatta, can I bring you in next? Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. A uh, quick point. Uh, I think uh, when we ever, whenever we talk about uh, science communication and ways to improve uh, the practice in India, we always keep talking to each other within a small echo chamber. There's a small number yeah. of people and there's a lot of scope to bring in more people, more voices and um, you know, be more inclusive in general. That's, that's the one point that I'd like to uh, you know, mention quickly. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tedata. Uh, Shuli? You know, that was my point. We need to, uh, uh, other than speaking with each uh, each other, we need to step out and also speak with people who, we, uh, who this uh, profession is going to support and get their perspectives. Also, you know, I think we are all learning while we have the time, when we have the time. I think we also need to mentor when we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Shuli, for that. And uh, Sundata. Yeah, I'll notes. just remind that historically science communication started in India, not as an institutional role, but for a much larger societal goal. Right. And somehow in the recent times, it has really shifted from there to just getting more eyeballs to our own institutions. I just would like that our institutions remember how it started in India and how it is also very unique to India. We realized when we spoke yeah. to our colleagues in North America that I mean, they didn't have that perspective. So right. when it is something so intrinsically India, I mean, yeah. it is something I would like that that makes the basis of science communication in India going ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Those are fantastic, I think, final points, thoughts to, to end this uh, session. And thank you all, not just for this webinar, but I think for taking such an active uh, role in this exercise of, of Psycom Think Labs, just fighting your competing, uh, you know, priorities uh, at institution, at your institution and otherwise. Uh, but I think this is a testament to, you know, your commitment of all the working group members, commitment of not just looking at SciComm as an individual endeavor, but really as a community uh, effort and a community endeavor. So there's a lot to be done. That's very clear. And I think that's what we found out from this exercise. Uh, uh, and um, there's a lot we've learned and there's some useful resources that we've developed that needs to be shared more widely for which we should also get more or feedback on. Uh, and I think we'll share that, I think, during the course of this uh, session as well. Um, and, and I think we need to have more discussions around more productive strategic discussions, not just complaining, ranting. We do need those two uh, to, to feel sane and, and normal. But uh, I think we also need to increasingly move towards more productive uh, strategic discussions around science communication and public engagement. So thank you all so very much once again uh, to all of you and all the working group members and our Think Labs advisors, uh, your contribution and support was uh, immense and uh, hope we can continue working together on these projects or, or uh, even otherwise. So thank you all. And uh, I'm going to quickly shift gears. Um, you know, while we are looking at Think Labs, uh, you know, which is very specific um, themes that we were looking at, I, I want to now transition to a slightly broader topic. Um, and uh, for that, I've, you know, we've got some really good uh, folks who can you know really help us think through that uh, again i don't think um, 40 minutes is enough to unpack this this topic of how can we unlock the potential of science communication and public engagement in india uh, but nonetheless uh, we'll we'll still try to uh, hear th their thoughts and uh, based on their experiences so i'm really uh, thrilled to introduce our panelists for this discussion uh, professor k vijay raghavan uh, dr janvi palke uh, Dr. Anil Kumar Challa and Dr. Namrata Sen Gupta. So, if I can request all the speakers to please switch on your uh, video cameras. And thank you all for joining. And, uh, you know, to set the stage, and something we also uh, discovered uh, during the SciCom Think Labs process is that science communication, there are a lot of different terms used for it. And we are constantly drowning in these terms and jargons. Um, uh, related to science communication and public engagement. So, um, so I would like to know from you, how do you define science communication and public engagement within your specific context? Uh, I definitely have learned that science communication is not just about making science accessible. That's definitely one part and there are many facets of it. And I think all of you represent different 
um, aspects of, of science uh, and science communication. So I would like to know how would you dis define it? Is it based on an activity, a goal, an outcome, or a or a combination of all of these? And sorry to start so abruptly, but uh, we don't have much time. And I would really like to you know get your thoughts uh, on on a lot of different things. So can I can I invite uh, Vijay uh, to maybe weigh on this? Uh, Vijay, would you like to give us your definition? of science communication and public engagement or your understanding? Um, <laughs> I, I was I was hoping you'd start with John Ray or, Oh, I, uh, I love I you. <laughs> <laughs> but but in a, uh, since you've asked me, I'll, I'll get started. Um, you know, it's a big problem. And I liked uh, what Somdata mentioned earlier in the earlier session about looking at society and reaching science over there. The fundamental problem, no matter how you define science communication, is about asking, what are the consequences of your efforts? Are you communicating or not? Um, and I don't find in all the definitions of science communication, a feedback loop which measures that and brings it back into changing the way we communicate. Uh, perhaps the only context where we see that in a relatively live manner is something like the science galleries because uh, people come there and you can get an assessment of what they're doing and then it comes back. Now, it's not to say that science communication has no impact, therefore, or its impact is unjudgeable. If you look at the planetarium at Bangalore and Mumbai and Mysore, there's one in the Karnataka University in Dharwar. I mean, they get an enormous number of students coming in every day. And, you know, it's maybe a large amount of communication is by osmosis. Mm -hmm. But if you look at people who have gone from these places uh, and you talk to them years later, um, you find that they were inspired, a small number of them were inspired. Right. Now, is that enough? Is that the right number? Is it the right way? We don't know. Mm -hmm. But that is one component of science communication where you reach a very large number of people. At the other end of the spectrum, you have science communication, which needs to reach the elite, um, the uh, ruling classes, and communicate the complexities of science almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, conveying deep science in simple language. Right. Uh, and in between, you have science communication for scientists themselves so that they understand each other's areas. But scientists also need science communication tools when they go to funding agencies, international organizations, to politicians for supporting big science. Um, so it's, it's a lot of things. Now, my problem is that we, um, and the last session was an example, without meaning to in the slightest bit um, saying anything that all of what was said was valid, is we now need to move on and we have the ability to move on now to actually having doing something about what we want to do, right? right. Now, um, the question is how to do that. How do we create courses which are on scale uh, for all kinds of definitions of science communication so that people can link that with jobs? How do we link that, you know, change, um, thank you, or use the a planetarium model to scale science communication um, to large numbers of people. Now, let me give you one example of what is happening, and I don't know whether you're aware, and I'll end with that because I'm mindful that of time and what others need to do. Interestingly, the finance minister uh, said about four years ago that she is an MP from Karnataka, She's got NP Lads funds and she wants to use that to build a planetarium. Now the MP Lads funds are modest and she wanted to do it in modest meaning. It's about 12 or 15 crores, it's not a small sum. So she 
push the DST and the DB uh, and the DAE and ask whether they're interested. Not only were they interested, but they're building a huge planetarium called the Cosmos in Mysore. It's driven by Annapurni Subramaniam, the director of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and her communication team. Um, I think you know some of those people there. Uh, and they are develop a world-class planetarium for students, but also they have tinkering labs there so that young students can understand the complexities of astronomy and so on. And the way the planetarium is designed, it can be used for deep ocean exploration, uh, cosmodrome kind of um, uh, shows and, and so on. So that's a third, yet another kind of science communication, scaling up the planetarium model or the um, you know science galleries model in different ways. So there's a lot of scope for expansion, a lot of exciting things to be done. And we need such integrating environments where people can come together, connect with what is needed, connect with champions and start doing many more things. Sorry, I took too long. No, that's that's great. Thank you so much for setting that context and, and also how the meanings of science communication, public engagement changes depending on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, Janvi, can I request you to come in next with a definition or your understanding of science communication, public engagement? Thank you. Thank you also for asking me after Vijay, because now I'm able to speak to context. He's already established the, la the large picture. And I think that's very, very yeah. important. Yeah. Um, so um, what, how do I understand science communication? And I, I think there is a distance between science communication and public engagement. Right. Public engagement is one form of science communication, as Vijay has already established. Right. And there are other reasons why science communication needs to happen, where as, as um, uh, again, I, I won't now keep saying as Vijay said, Oh. to each other, to younger generations in order to help them build a perspective on their own profession, for example, right? Like, so, so, there's, um, so there's that. I won't speak to science communication so much because I'm not one and I don't practice it, but I do public engagement um, uh, and both as a historian of science, but also now with Science Gallery Bangalore. So I think what, what we have, a, we have an audience, our target audience is the public. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, science communication becomes a public education project when it's conducted in this manner. And that right. itself has had a long journey, starting with, you know, the cabinets of curiosities to science museums with large historical collections, right. uh, telling a story of how this knowledge came to be, to then science centers, which, you know, kind of removed uh, ideas in science or concepts in science from their historical context to right. say, okay, this is science, you don't really need to worry about history. Right. So now to the gallery, which kind of takes it, you know, one step. I, I don't necessarily see these as linear processes, but it's a right. different kind of beast. Hmm. And I think what um, what we what I understand by public engagement is hmm. the ability, as we've seen through these historical transformations of that institutional format for a public space for knowledge, right. to give insight to someone who's not a practicing scientist into how knowledge is produced. Mm -hmm. I think that to me, is the primary function of public engagement, one that offers insight to someone who's not a scientist themselves or, or not a practitioner in the domain that, uh, that is at hand uh, about how, how and why do questions arise? How and why does research happen? And that, that also, I think it, it, helps, uh, it helps me that I trained in history of science because that's the perspective that I bring to this, um, right. necessarily only to historicize ideas, but also to say, how does one then place them in, in contemporary context? If one could right. do that in the, uh, for the past, one can do that also, of course, for the present and right. then also for the future. So uh, I look at, I look at, and, I, and that's my last thought, mm -hmm. look at these public spaces for knowledge as one form of communication, but the burden I think that we carry today, not burden, but the responsibility that we carry today is one of becoming a bridge institution, but one that is a two-way bridge. Right. Not right. only takes research in credible manner into the public domain, but also then brings back public response, public feedback, but also public aspirations and desires in right. conversations about research. So I think that's that would be my take on public engagement as understood through the project that I'm leading on. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you, uh, Janvi. And uh, um, I think I'll, I'll invite Anil now as a, as a scientist, educator, uh, communicator. I mean, what has been your you know relationship with science communication or your understanding of it? Uh, 
if you can come in next. Thanks, Sarah. So um, I will probably wear the hat of a university because I, I currently reside in the university ecosystem. And I think it's a very natural thing. Uh, I think that if you remove all the other labels, uh, at least what is naturally accepted as science communication is happening every day in the right. university uh, arena. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in terms of how do you define it, uh, I think uh, what should happen and what happens, I think there's a slight uh, gap. Mm -hmm. So what should happen is the outcome. Mm -hmm. What is happening? And I think everybody alluded, even the earlier panel, as to what is the impact of it? Right. What is happening to, after science communication, what is the effect? But what's usually happening is the activity part. You just, you know, you pick a chapter, you pick a particular topic, and that's what is communicated. Uh, and the outcome is sometimes lost. I mean, if it, it can happen. Uh, and so I think, uh, uh, personally, I feel the outcome needs to be at the forefront. And then in education, we call it the backward design. So once you know what you want to achieve, then you design your assessments, and therefore you design your activities and the material that you need. Um, and I think one point that Janavi mentioned, which kind of uh, uh, kind of I, I I resonate with that is, I think in the traditional sense, science is still taught or communicated as a bunch of facts. But I think the process of science, I think that's what she alluded to. And being a history of science buff myself, I think um, if people get it, either in the uh, formative years, in the early education or the you know university environment or and that spirit continues, I think a large part of the uh, the go the, what we want to achieve in science communication will be achieved um, right. because we understand the process of science. So I thought, I think yeah. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Anil. Thank you so much. It's been great because it's like varying meanings of science communication to two-way you know, communication between public and science. Uh, and, and Anil, to your, to, to your point of also outcome-focused uh, uh, science communication. Uh, Namrata, first of all, thank you very much for joining us so early in the morning. It's probably, I don't know how early uh, uh, there it is, but thank you so much. We, was, we were really keen to also get a you know, perspective of um, places, regions where you know, science communication has been formalized to you know, a great extent and how is it happening, what's working for them and what isn't. So that's why you know, thank you for joining us and please help us maybe through the discussion to, to tell us a bit about what, you know, your institution is doing and what the larger landscape in uh, the US and North America looks like in science communication. Um, so to you, Namrita, what, what is your understanding of science communication and public engagement and, and, and yeah, how do you, how do you relate to it? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Fast India for inviting me. Um, for me personally, I've kind of uh, seen various aspects of science communication through my work and have been really grateful that I had the opportunity to work. When I started in this field, I kind I started as a science communicator that is, you know, writing for the public um, and writing about research that is happening at our institution. Uh, my role then evolved more into public engagement with science uh, because I lead a team that uh, build and now operates a discovery center, which is a free public science museum at our institute. So that itself like kind of uh, signals that our institution is really committed to public engagement. So that's uh, exactly like, you know, as uh, John, we was alluding to, like that's the place where we have a two way street. Like mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. get to interact directly with the public in the space. And uh, the other part of my role is science policy. So I feel like for each of these things, there is a, almost like audience is what uh, defines my context of science communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, so activity is, of course, uh, based on the audience that we are mm -hmm. catering to and the form of whether it's science policy, whether it's uh, uh, public engagement. The other thing that is really important is uh in public engagement, like I've learned that uh, there is so much you can learn like directly from the public. So we are more like outcome and learning oriented in that part of science communication because we get to gather insights pretty much on a week to week basis, on a month to month basis. Right. Uh, science policy or public policy is kind of much more larger and like it feels societal and it's more goal oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just like 
for a particular institution or for a particular uh, group of scientists. So I kind of see it as a more like state level or national level interest. Uh, and uh, I think you approach public policy and science policy with a goal when you're communicating in that. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's really interesting to kind of be an, in all these fields and getting to see and uh, understanding what my role is. But what I also do uh, enjoy in addition to these three things is getting to work very closely with scientists and mm -hmm. especially early career scientists or PhD students and coaching them to be better communicators and giving them like teaching them the principles on how to communicate uh, about their research to a non-specialist audience. And yeah. uh, that's kind of something which I feel is uh, I'm thinking a lot about these days. Yeah. I mean, I think all these responses, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for that. And and I think all these responses highlight just the diversity of approaches in this field and, and the meanings that are at play. Uh, and I think we have to acknowledge that. Uh, so now maybe I would like to, um, you know, delve a little deeper into institutional experiences. And 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 Vijay, if I can perhaps bring you in first, uh, you know, NCBS was one of the first institutions to formalize um, institutional science communication or communications, as well as science and society programs. Uh, so could you walk us through the development of these programs at NCBS and also, I think, in the backdrop of how science communication at that time was evolving in the country? So if you could, you know, tell us a bit about that story. Yeah, you know, I think um, we must uh, see in context um, two things. One, there was amongst those involved in the early stages of NCBS uh, an appreciation of two components. One, that there were formal science communication structures which were in the government system. The CSRs, MISCARE, for example, uh, and you know magazines such as Science uh, Reporter. And in the private sector, there were Science Today, uh, we all grew up with Scientific American and other science magazines. So in many ways, the generation of people who took to science were the beneficiaries of science communication by others. And therefore, there was a feeling that this, this was long before the time where there was pressure from uh, funders to communicate well. In fact, there was zero pressure at all. Mm. And uh, so at that time, the idea was to do that. That's one point to keep in mind. Yeah. The second point is that we were very um, lucky at that time to, at the early stages, to have people from the humanities and social sciences come in as visitors to the institution for relatively long periods, whether they were photographers, movie makers, historians, economists, several people came in. And one of them was Janaki Nair, who uh, then started a program uh, called Through the Lens of the Life Sciences. And it was started in, uh, held in a hall in central Bangalore at a place called the Mythic Society, which is a very old Bangalore society with a magnificent hall. And in that hall, we had a series of lectures on different topics of life sciences for the lay public. You know, how the brain works, what are the cutting edge areas of biology today, how the cell works, how organisms are made, and so on and so forth. So there was an organic growth of these kinds of areas which led to two threads. One, historians of science, such as Indira Chaudhary, who was introduced to NCBS by Janaki, getting into the history of science uh, and doing oral history and everything else. And then the other thread was to have a stronger science communication group uh, within NCBS. And I would say that NCBS should take justifiable pride in stimulating both these kinds of things in the broader ecosystem right. and being, uh, you know, um, a generous host to these systems while they were going up, um, starting a science journalism workshop. Um, you know, Anand Anathaswamy just walked in one day and said whether he could do it and people were welcoming and he's been doing that. So I think the 10th such workshop now has been absolutely terrific. So it was organic. It wasn't a top-down 
demand for something to be accounted for and it's gone well. And I think a combination um, of science communication, but also uh, archival work and history of science uh, is growing. So, um, you know, it takes time. And really our challenge today is, can we do these things at without compromising quality on larger scale and with greater speed? Thank you. Great, yeah. Thank you, thank you Vijay for that. And I think it, one of the key ideas that I, I captured was, you know, institutions have to be more open to these encounters. And I think, uh, and, and it's, you know, when institutions say that, you know, we cannot, we have limitations or restrictions for letting uh, people from other disciplines come in or have these uh, very, you know, experimental uh, public engagement activities or science communication activities, um, that is probably not fully justified. I think institutions can do it if they if they want to do it. Um, so Janvi, uh, I guess, again, you know, drawing from your institutional experience, you know, Science Gallery is one of the few, uh, Bangalore is one of the few institutions in India dedicated entirely to public engagement with science, which is a very exciting thing thing for many of us in the field. So can you tell us, uh, you know, can you discuss maybe the motivation behind the gallery and how it is really uh, finding its own place in the current landscape uh, of, of, you know, science communication and public engagement? Sure, thank you. So yes, we are incredibly lucky in that we are an institution founded to do precisely this work. And it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to have that, the, the kind of resources we have at our disposable to, uh, disposal to do, uh, to do this work. So, you know, as some of you, some of us are aware, but probably uh, it is useful to any way uh, state it upfront is that we are a part of an international network of galleries. So we are six of us across the world right now. And the idea started out at Trinity College Dublin to bring artists and scientists or natural scientists together to create public engagement around new, newest sort of forms of research. Now, uh, the idea went global at some point and uh, uh, we were, in fact, Bangalore was the second to sign up globally. King's College London was the first. And, and uh, today, the th is things stand as follows. Five of our sibling galleries are on university campuses, owned by universities, run by universities as exhibition galleries because research and labs are in-house. Bangalore is an outlier because of a couple of reasons that all of us will very quickly connect with. And in fact, it connects back, Sarah, to what you were just saying, uh, which is that our, uh, un first of all, uh, we, have, we have dedicated institutions of higher education and research. We, we have very few universities as such, right? Like in the expansive sense the, that, um, that exists, say, in Europe. That's, again, not Europe and America, uh, uh, well, the rest, rest of the world. And, and this is not to say that that's necessarily something to look at or whatever, but this is, this is what it is. You know, our engineers study with engineers and our architects study with architects, whereas if you go to a King's College London, you know, you could be sitting at the lunch table next to a law, a law student, as a student, I mean, or as a physics student, you could be sitting next to someone with a massive camera kit because they're going out to film something, right? Which is very, very, well, which is next to impossible on our campuses, right? Like, and, and so we, so that was the first concern to where do you place a gallery that is meant to bring scholars from across disciplines together with artists. The second is public engagement. Our universities don't have public engagement budgets. And our universities also, you know, even the the institutions of higher learning, the institutes that I that I you know that that are fairly well ranked and have incredible research and are are sort of you know fairly open. It's very hard even to enter the campus of an institution, no matter how intellectually open it is, for someone who doesn't know someone there or doesn't have a set purpose. You cannot just walk up to the Indian Institute of Science or National Center for Biological Sciences or IIT Madras or, you know, what have you, and say, I'd like to go in for a walk to just find out, unless it's open day, to find out what, what they do with, you know, the tax money that, you know, all of us collectively pay. So it's... Uh, you know, so it's very hard to do that. And so how do you place a public institution, an institution targeted at getting the public in your doors uh, uh, on a campus of that kind? And we were lucky in that the government of Karnataka stepped, is a, stepped in as a founding patron and gave us our land and the first capital, which was then matched by philanthropy. So the way we stand today, we are, we are by institutional design, 
much, much broader than an exhibition gallery. We do not only do exhibitions. We have six experimental spaces that hopefully will go live fairly soon. Um, two of those are now fully funded. You know, I'm very sort of delighted that people sort of found some value in the mad idea of having public labs. Um, and, and uh, you know, once they are live, I think, you know, we'll be sort of a, we'll be truly sort of a, uh, how should I put it, uh, a, a new version of an old idea of a public space for knowledge and sort of giving the giving teeth to the idea of being this bridge, a two-way bridge rather than, you know, a one-way bridge. And so uh, here we are today, an independent autonomous institution, uh, truly a public-private partnership. Um, and I have to say, um, as a closing thought on this, um, I, I grew up in Bombay, so I'm not native to Bangalore, but I cannot imagine doing this in any other city in India than Bangalore because of the openness, the energy and, you know, the readiness of the city to take a new idea and help it grow. And the kind of partnerships that we've been able to develop, not only within the city, but also outside, um, is actually quite remarkable. I mean, and, and as a historian of science, you know, I've seen enough sort of in the archives to know that it, it's not easy to pull these things off. And so, um, yeah, we are, we are very lucky uh, to have this. So as of to, as of now, the, the institution has roughly half and half space dedicated to public labs, an idea that takes off from... Uh, C.B. Raman's biography, because he's someone who, for the first 10 years of his professional life, was an accountant with the Indian Audits and Accounts Services. And, uh, you know, in the evenings, paid a small bench fee and carried out his experiments at the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. And so let's see, you know, once our labs are live, if, you know, there's something else that can happen in these labs at all um, for someone, you know, for people who are passionate about some ideas that need pursuing, but uh, they're not sort of... Uh, you know, and in a change context, of course, one can never, once you know, you never, of course, step in the same river twice, uh, but also the nature of scientific inquiry has changed today. So we need a different kind of public space for knowledge. So can this be the place where we are able to, through conversations with unusual partners, arrive at better research questions? So I think the labs are, labs as well as the exhibition floor is dedicated to creating those conversations across generations, across disciplines, in order to just see if, you know, there's some way to reach that point. Uh, you're, you're muted, Sarah. Sorry, I don't know that how that happened. No, I was saying that for collective knowledge making, I also, I think to the point that Siddharth was earlier making. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Janvi. And I think you also touched upon a very important point about an ecosystem to support a, a disruptive idea like this. Uh, and you need that. You need the most unusual people coming together to, to give rise to such uh, unusual, uh, non-traditional ideas in India. And again, I'm just thinking of how we can replicate more of this, you know, how we can have more of this in, in the country. But thank you for sharing that, Janvi. Uh, Adil, uh, I think moving on uh, to you and, you know, as a, as a You've already mentioned about university setting and doing science communication engagement in a university setting. What are some challenges? What are some enablers in university or research institutions for scientists um, uh, to undertake uh, science communication? What are some um, structures do you, you need there? What are some policies that you think are missing or are there? Uh, could you just reflect on how universities and research institutions can perhaps better enable scientists and students to undertake and maybe make their you know figurative and literal walls institutional walls more porous and like you know and like Janvi said and Vijay said that you know for, for ideas to come in for people to come in for unusual encounters to happen no I think it's uh and it's a perfect segue to what Janvi said in the sense I think in in a in a, in a um I think since universities have become those silos the a, a, a gallery has to come up, right? But if the universities were, were a natural, uh, integral part of a community, I don't think we would have needed a special uh, yeah. format or a special forum to address you, right? And I think, uh, fortunately, I think- Public uh, though, Anil, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm breaking format here, but for the public to be, that's a different, that's a different part. No, and I, I completely agree. But I think in the, in the pure sense of a university, uh, I, I, at least personally, I don't see the divide between a traditional student versus public, right? I think uh, being in a university campus, I do feel that 
uh, it is part of the community and it should be non-porous. And I think from a structural point of view, um, we need galleries, but I think the universities already exist. So in some sense, the spirit of the gallery and the spirit of the university as a, uh, as a knowledge sharing institution uh, should actually become, it should mature in some sense. I mean, I mean it's there. And personally, you know, uh, when Janavi was making her point, you know, I did my undergrad at Banaras University and I cannot think of another place uh, in my own life experience which could have been that place. You know, in fact, it's an open campus. People could walk in and you could experience some of these things. It did not happen so often. Uh, but coming back, I think I just wanted to make one point in terms of the challenges and what can happen. Uh, I feel that traditional boundaries are breaking down significantly, yeah. right? And the last few years, we have seen that. Uh, the classrooms are not anymore brick and mortar. Uh, they are they're, they're digital, they're everywhere. Um, and I think all of us as part of community, uh, you know, of, of the part of the community, no matter what uh, hats we wear, we can uh, be part of this public engagement or the science uh, education okay. part, right? And so again, uh, I think uh, in the institutional sense at the university, I feel that uh, internally, a teaching faculty or research faculty, they need to uh, adopt adapt new roles mm -hmm. into community engagement mm -hmm. because i think at the at the bottom of it we are seeking public money to conduct research so there is some that, i think if that spirit is instilled i think some of these things uh, will naturally happen and they can be yeah. bolstered by other efforts right. and i'll stop there yeah yeah those are good points thank you uh, vijay your virtual hand is up do you yeah, yeah, but but why, why, why don't you finish, uh, Sarah? And I'll, I need just if I have time, I'll make a don't, couple don't, of points. But don't no worry rush. about this. Don't don't worry about disrupting the format. I feel free to butt it at any any time. Uh, change the questions. Uh, you know, I won't mind. Uh, but yeah, Vijay, if there was anything that you wanted to respond to Anil or Janvi's point, uh, please please. Well, quick please. quickly to both the points. I think yeah. um, the practical matter is. While in theory, there are university environments which are open, like Bangalore University and its colleges or uh, and so on, the practical matter is uh, it's unlikely that either students or faculty will take up these responsibilities on scale in today's yeah. environment. That's yeah. the hard fact. I mean, and I'm be delighted to be corrected. Now, yeah. that said, I just wanted to add one more point. The Cosmos... Planetarium coming up in, in Mysore is in Mysore University. It's in partnership with Mysore University. It will be open for Mysore University students and for anyone else. Um, it's a central government Mysore University partnership. It's got all the potential dangers of thinking into routine, but it's also got a lot of the excitement. If on this, if, you know, excited uh, stimulating people, communicators, uh, public engagement people come. Looks like that's happening. So uh, those are the two points I'd like to. Yeah, thank you, Vijay. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so Namrata, uh, you know, you're at uh, Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Um, and of course, other than um, a lot of money, what are some other, say, policies or culture that's sort of embedded in the institute uh, that that ensures that public engagement remains a priority, you know, for for an institution like uh, Broad, and 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 I think it would be really helpful if you can even share examples of such policies or programs that support the work that you and you know your team does, uh, you know, at at, at Broad. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just prior to that, I, I'll explain the structure of the organization that might help because Broad Institute is an independent nonprofit research institution. Right. Uh, that is partnered with, of course, our two part uh, key partners are MIT and Harvard University and its mm -hmm. affiliated hospitals. So uh, our partner institutions is a big part of our audience as well, in addition to the public. Uh, so projects kind of happen. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on kind of the programmatic nature first. That is, uh, commitment to public engagement is demonstrated through, I would say, uh, we have 
multiple public talks a year where we are you know inviting the public we are making sure it is also streamed online and the video is made accessible within a few days uh, so that's a big like that programming has existed for a while at our institution and has drawn hundreds and hundreds of people every year to uh, this type of a community gathering. We also think of like kind of public engagement through not just our central office of communications, which is uh, kind of a typical thing you would see in uh, research institutions here, uh, like a news office or an office of communications or a public information office. And so most of us who are communicating science are kind of based out of that office. But then the other model that is also quite pretty strongly embedded in institutions, research institutions is uh, uh, like an education and outreach office, which can be separate from this office. So our organization has an office of STEM engagement and inclusion, and they are very student focused. So mm -hmm. I would say the whole like K through 12, uh, up until 12th grade and like also undergraduate students. So they, they their grants, their programming and everything is very like student education outcome focused. Whereas our office kind of focused largely like everybody is a part of our audience, which kind of makes it very difficult at times, but we mm -hmm. understand where, where we find our audiences and what kind of outreach we need to do. So our activities can include not just public talks, news stories, blogs, videos, social media is a pretty good place where you can engage with the general public. But also, as I said, Broad Discovery Center, which is our museum. The right. other thing, which is a big part of like, I would say public engagement, but in a very different lens is a lot of, most of our research is human disease and biomedical research focused. So as a result of that, uh, there are, scientific labs and departments which are possibly running projects uh, that have the element of patient partnered research or participant partnered research. So mm -hmm. these scientific groups are kind of doing their own like community engagement. Right. And right. it's a part of their built into their grant. Yes, it is kind of essential for them to build awareness. Like we have a really large program at our institute called Count Me In, which is Anyone living in the United States can send, if they have experienced cancer, they can send, you know, their samples uh, for, uh, to be a part of the study. So it's, it's kind of like also research with patient partnership is a big element of our public engagement goals. Uh, and uh, I would say that because, I mean, we are a nonprofit institution, but almost one third or more of our funding is federal funding. So mm -hmm. as you know, again, like uh, right. the comp like what we talked about earlier, this is our uh, tax funded research, you know, our taxpayer, uh, our, they, we want to like make sure that an institutions kind of have that accountability that since this is publicly funded, uh, like federal dollars for mm -hmm. uh, any types of research at most universities and research institutions, it is a responsibility to like communicate that to the public. And that's mm -hmm. why these central offices have been created, I would say, in different organizations. If you think about like uh, federal funding that comes in, so mm -hmm. there, there will be an item of like FNA, which is like facilities and administrative costs. And that type of a, like budget from your federal fund that comes in to fund research projects would go towards supporting offices like you know, communications or HR, right. or I would say like uh, uh, grant management, things like right. that. So it's kind of built into the structure and right. universities and institutions are kind of using that since so much of the research is federally funded. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Namita. Very helpful um, overview. Um, I, I think it always makes me think why we are not able to do that at Indian institutions. And I think that brings me to the point of resources and uh, funding. And Janvi, you mentioned about, uh, you know, that Science Gallery is, is part public, part private funded. So how can we catalyze more funding, more resources for, um, for science communication? How can we make a more effective business case or a social? I think we're able to make a social case for science communication easily, but how do we make a strong business case for science communication so that we can get more funding for it? Hmm. So, you know, there are two ways to answer this question. And let me hmm. sort of get one answer out of the way because it's not a very practical one, but hmm. it's an important one. It's, you know, so what, what is the business case in terms of, you know, what is the business case for primary education? What is the business hmm. case for literacy? What is the business case for 
um, you know, so a range of things like that, right? Like, and, and I don't mean to make a, a, a moral argument, a moral, moral and rhetorical argument. I think there, are, there is a high cost to be paid for not mm -hmm. having a informed right. citizen, right? Like, I mean, and, uh, you know, one of the programs I go back to on occasion um, is the Stanford Civics Initiative, mm -hmm. which started out in the 1920s. And they used to run a course called Problems of Citizenship. Uh, which had a very, very interesting curriculum. And, and the Stanford Civics Initiative continues to date, right? Mm. So and it's, it's, an, it's an initiative from within an engineering or largely largely engineering and technical institution. But I think there is a high cost to be paid for an uninformed citizenry. And especially today, if you look at the kind of crises we confront, okay, well, op opportunities and crises both that we confront, is that you can't conduct politics without un understanding electoral behavior, which you can't understand without social media. So, you know, you, so that... You can't, I mean, you, in, in, and I've used this example again and again because it makes the point very well. You know, you can't teach political science anymore right. without understanding the place and space of technology and how it's altering voter, right. voter behavior. So I think if, 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 our, if our concerns and our opportunities are artificial intelligence, pandemics, climate change, uh, new medical technologies, gene editing, then how can you afford a citizenry, whether they are practicing scientists or not, to function? with any amount of both dignity, but also correct decisions, if you are not participating actively in their education. So it's it's equally important, and this is a point that Vijay made earlier, is that it, it's not that the, the silos are manifested in India in a particular way, but the silos affect also research. Physicists aren't talking necessarily to biologists who aren't necessarily talking, so on and so forth. And especially the 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 sort of you know the chasm between the human, social, and natural sciences is massive, and we are not going to be able to tackle. Uh, uh, and I'll use a phrase which I really genuinely find sort of too trite, wicked problems of today, um, because it's shorthand. Uh, if we aren't do having these conversations, and so I think it is imperative that we invest in public education around new research. Mm -hmm. across the human, social, and natural sciences so that the human sciences and social sciences realize the inadequacy of their methods and questions to address mm -hmm. contemporary concerns. And likewise, equally, that our engineers and scientists begin to understand that social concerns are not to be, not, not a hammer in search of a, sorry, they shouldn't be going out with their research like hammers in search of nails, but actually understand what it is that is what is it that are people's concerns on the ground, for example? What are the questions right. they're asking? And for me, one eye opener right. was when we had Gagandeep Kang speaking during the Contagion uh, mm -hmm. exhibition that we had organized entirely online thanks to the pandemic. The questions were heartbreaking questions, you know? And these were people who knew Contagion was happening, could get online and could type in English, right? Like, and so um, I right. extrapolate yeah. from there, right? Mm. So I think... It's, it's expensive to not have this. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, by way of uh, looking at, uh, by way of the more practical question, where do we look for funds, right? Like, so yeah. in our case, we have gone, the government has supported. And, and I've said this again and again, I would not have left behind a tenured position in an academic institution to do this project if it wasn't backed by the government. Mm -hmm. Because any enduring public institutions are built with state support. And in India, especially, you cannot get far without state support. So mm -hmm. I think speaking to governments is important. Bilinguality mm -hmm. is important. And the governments will invest once you promise bilinguality at a level, not of tokenism, but of like at a dignified level, right? So I think government support is incredibly important. Second is, yes, high net worth individuals, but everybody in the country seems to be running to the same individual. So that's at some point going to be a problem. But I think CSR is a, is, is something to be tapped into because, you know, uh, it is a year after year after year thing, right? Like, and so I think uh, one can look for uh, sort of, how should I call it? Sensitizing, socializing CSR uh, agencies or companies or firms to look at this as an ongoing thing where you don't kind of come and do one thing and so patient funding, as Rohini Nilakani calls it, right? Like where you where you bring money and you say, okay, for the next five years, we'll fund this program for you and let's examine at the end of it. Of course, we'll do it on a periodic basis also, but at the end of five years, have you done something, right? Like, so I think CSR funding is equally important. And the last one 
is mm-hmm. something we are now beginning to explore and structure, which is, you know, I call it the Barack Obama model, which is retail funding, right? Like, which is small funding. So friends of the institution, friends of the gallery, where let the public come in with whatever amounts they can give. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll end this uh, by... Mm-hmm. Because there's a structure to be given to it, which will always be context as well as institution specific. Um, a public library in Dharwad is not going to get the same kind of you know attention and funding and traction as a science gallery in Bangalore. So one can't be blind to context at all. Yes. Um, I'll end with something you know which 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 was which was a very hard sort of heartening and yet sort of well, it was an important moment for me because it it did bring it did moisten my eyes is when we did our very first exhibition, which was at the Rangoli Metro Art Center in Bangalore, which is at the Metro Art Center, a small gallery, a small exhibition. I have no idea where our confidence to think that we could do an exhibition even came from, but we had that exhibition and it was free for everyone. And in the end, we had a little box for people's suggestions. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember going out for lunch and seeing a family of four sitting there and just kind of, I didn't quite know what was happening. And so I just said, did you enjoy it? And they said, We've never seen anything like this before, which is really actually, which should really shame us all because in a in a city like Bangalore, you know, an exhibition yeah. like Elements, which really wasn't the most sophisticated one we've done. And then they said like, you know, is this really free? And I said, yes, that's the goal to keep it free for everyone for, you know, the long as long as, you know, as absolutely long as we can. Yeah. And then they said, but can we give some money? And they gave a hundred rupee note, you know, and I, I had no heart to say no, but it tells yeah. you what there is. And, you know, so that hundred rupee, I think has, I mean, it, on the one hand, if there were a hundred thousand people willing to give you a hundred rupees, there's already oh. something moving, but it also has value. Mm. A very different kind when there's, when there's cultural ownership. Absolutely. Of yeah. knowledge in that kind, right? Like I always say, and I'll end with this thought, which is that we have a, I've said this before. So some of you have heard me say this, please forgive me. But I I, I do want to repeat this because I, I, I think all of us should probably recognize it in our own ways, which is that we have a very strong professional conversation around science and engineering in India, mm-hmm. which is about ranks, institutions, placements, salaries. Um, so, you know, what, what do we make of a profession or a career, not a vocation, but a career mm-hmm. in science engineering, we don't have a cultural conversation. Right. And I think our job is to, from the range of science communication, public engagement, all of us, I think, have the responsibility to make that cultural conversation and that ownership of knowledge right. production possible in the minimal ways that we can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing those you know, experiences, insights, and, you know, fun, not just fundraising, but why would, why would people want to fund it? You know, where would that in, incentive motivation come from? I think understanding that is very, very critical. Uh, so I, I, I realize we're almost uh, at time. So I'm just going to ask one final question. I, I realize I should have had this session for longer, given such fantastic uh, people on the panel. But Vijay, um, you know, we, we, we've established or rather we've sort of acknowledge that uh, science communication in India is, of course, you know, becoming, is we're making good strides, big strides, it's changing. We have, there are jobs, science communication jobs, public engagement jobs, scientists are also taking it seriously. Um, so what's really holding us back? You know, what, what do we need to do to really unlock the potential of science communication? I mean, what needs to be done? If you could maybe share two or three ideas around that or you know, however uh, you wish to, that would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, I think while all of you who are putting in so much effort deserve congratulations on what you're doing, it's a really tough job. You must keep in mind that you've started from a very low baseline. Mm. Uh, and, mm. and therefore, you know, going from zero to something is impressive. And not to say that what you're doing is not impressive, but mm. keep in mind that the baseline is low. Yeah. So the question is, going forward now is going to be very difficult because mm. going from something to more is much tougher. You have, you have started exhausting the number of people who mm. will have initiative, the kinds of resources, the kinds of locations, and so on. So the challenge of footprint expansion is a much more complicated challenge. Right. The short answer to, to how that can expand 
without mm. compromising quality speedily is that it becomes an economically attractive and viable profession, right? right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to those with passion alone coming here and mm -hmm. staying on despite everything. Can right. we make that happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer to that lies in, there are some positive signs. The demands of both industry and academia and of the public, by, by that I mean the uh, publicly facing sectors such as in health, agriculture, NGOs, state governments, those demands are growing. Everyone sees the value of at the least an interpreter of science mm -hmm. and at the most a feedback communicator from the public to agencies, institutions, industry, and that. So the mm -hmm. job situation is going to be better. Industries are going to have more openings. State mm -hmm. governments, NGOs are going to have more openings. And therefore, I would very simply say that if institutions can get together and have a really top quality course which covers everything as part of their curriculum in a sensible manner, it can be done. And to do that, I would urge the clusters of institution in the South Delhi area, for example, and in the Bangalore, North Bangalore area to get together and offer, you know, both science communication as a credit for undergraduates, but have mm -hmm. a dedicated science communication course. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. Uh, Namrata, uh, just wondering if you want to maybe uh, share some lessons, learnings, uh, for you know, for 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 India, based on your experience of working in uh, North America, uh, anything that you think would can be applied here, can can work here, anything that comes to mind? Yeah, uh, I would have said that what Fast India is doing is actually an excellent model because you are convening, and you're you've been able to convene people across like so many institutions, so many expertise. So uh, this is actually how like change and impact happens. So uh, I, from an advice perspective or from what I've learned here, uh, I think institutional buy-in kind of comes at different levels. Like uh, we like believe in a lot of this idea called piloting, like at least a lot of projects I've worked on, you like pilot something and you show the value and then you get buy-in to scale. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, like kind of building upon what, uh, you know, some of the ideas that have been shared here, even if it's like to establish a course, even if uh, if it's like a funding model to uh, from existing research budget at an institution that is government funded, like even if you if a one pilot can be shown that has success and then mm -hmm. to scale it and get buy in from stakeholders at all levels, uh, that would be, I feel, the possible next step. And um uh, can have really high impact. But I think what Fast India has done, like the ability to convene is like really powerful and uh, to diversify the stakeholders that you've already brought in here uh, to now like take the next level. You've done the landscape analysis. The next level is get the stakeholders from who would give you the ideas for buy-in and like more, uh, you know, institutionalizing things. So that yeah. would be possibly one of the next step. Thank you so much, Namrita. Those are really excellent points. Um, Anil, uh, from you, uh, what do you think sh should happen? What is holding us back? What will propel us forward in science communication and public engagement in India? No, I, it's all the three points that you know uh, I heard just now, right? Vijay and Namrata and uh, Janavi. So first thing I think I want to, I'm summarizing what they've already said, and I strongly believe this. Number one, um, the story that Janavi said that there's appetite. People want good products, right? And I mean, I mean, I actually I got emotional when <laughs> Janani was saying about that they were willing to pay a hundred rupees, right? That means there's appetite and there is this uh, intention to support that, right? Mm -hmm. and number two, and what Vijay mentioned, right? I I'm very positive. I think it's the effort has started. It's been probably modest early on, and I mm -hmm. think uh, again Namrata kind of uh, put that the fact that Fast India has done this and. I want to give out shout out to India Bioscience. They have these uh, small yeah. grants and these yeah. are pilots, right? And I yeah. think I strongly feel that if these pilots uh, bring about a product, a very high quality product, I think people are willing to pay. As in not necessarily monetarily, they are going to have a buy-in 
they will and engage yeah that community enlightenment that we are seeking will happen i mean the fact that you know i follow uh, the physics girl and i think a lot of people follow veritasium some of these people i'm not it's a very small segment probably but i can i see a lot of potential within india to make authentic very um, regionally sensitive and impactful uh, products coming out uh, which will uh, uh, actually be sus sustained self sustained yeah. so yeah. in summary i feel i mean uh, just to uh, uh, connect all the points that were made i feel very positive about how this is going to evolve i think the seeds have been sown and i think this is probably our i think all the frustrations probably out there are that the initial the you know the seedling is coming out of the earth and that painful uh, growth is probably what we are noticing uh, that's what i the way i am seeing it and so i i am extremely positive about how this is going to evolve yeah thank you so much anil i share your optimism uh, <laughs> and uh, janvi any final thoughts anything you want to share um... yeah i you know i had written it down and now i don't know which book i wrote it in because i have too many books in front of me but i know I'll, I'll i'll try and remember i think there was one point which i wanted to make towards the closing which is that i i think we we need um you know uh, which i already spoke about curriculum right like having oh. i think there is no there is no alternative to that oh. and i think that that so imagine that at different levels in different ways oh. right like so i think for example there was one moment when uh, i very audaciously when i when i was a young sort of faculty member very audaciously i went up to uh, shashidara who's now leading ncbs and i said look i have a model to change the change humanities and social sciences education for engineering and science in india right like and of course you know <laughs> when you're young you think you can do such things and then you know life teaches you to uh, sort of you know uh, <laughs> be a little more cautious but i'll yeah. come back to that and say that you know i think we need curricula that con that helps people who are doing science and engineering contextualize their profession and the yeah. minute they are able to do that i think a lot of our work in public engagement from science communication to public engagement becomes that much more uh, necessary but also possible right like and and i often say everyone says oh so scientists should be trained not everyone sorry i take that back i am now speaking like <laughs> like i'm like i'm you know i'm sitting in so at some coffee table many people say for example that scientists and engineers should be trained to do science communication i think mm. there's nothing there's no harm in helping those who are willing to think about how science may be taken into the public domain but i really don't yeah. think it should be made mandatory for someone whose primary vocation profession is to do cutting edge research let yeah. them let us build structures that enable them to ask better research questions that's a different problem but right. in terms of public engagement i think we need a much better cadre Mm. much better trained cadre of people who can help contextualize what's right. happening in the labs right and that means historians of science sociologists of science philosophers of science science writers science communicators so, range of people who will help place this in society yeah. at large right like, and, and that's when it happens so science communication isn't a thing or a profession alone but i think it's this it's this um drop of ink that has to in a way you know color oh. the water of what is science enterprise right like and i think right. that would probably be be a much much more long lasting thing oh. as so so yeah so curricular reform in every single way and of course you know basic skills like anil anand swami's workshop is fabulous because he tells you once you're interested and once you know what you want to do how to do it right like and right. so of course you need skilling and you know you do need people who know their craft that's right but i think this broader contextualization needs to happen at every level and therefore you know many i think ashoka university is already doing that mm -hmm. i think this is probably something necessary and this was part of my audacious model is that the foundation year across the human social natural sciences engineering art and design has to be the same 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 mm -hmm. you can't have historians who don't understand technology you can't have engineers who don't understand society or, or sociology and you know theorizing about society yeah. i think that we we pay a huge cost we pay it shrinks the imagination and it shrinks right. everybody's imagination in different ways and in different proportions so i think we we need we need that kind of curricular reform 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Janvi. And I think I just realized that I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to attempt summarizing this discussion. There's the very rich insights and ideas. Uh, but uh, I really hope we can continue these discussions. I hope we can be more provocative. We can be more, uh, you know, we can uh, speak the truth uh, when it needs to be. And, uh, and, and I just want to thank the panelists for their time, for the sharing their experience and insights with us and hope we can all stay connected and, and continue to um, you know, deliberate on many of these ideas that you've shared. And I think we have made a lot of strides uh, in science communication and public engagement. I think the sensibility of science communication and public engagement is changing, has changed, because India is you know, a lot more globally connected, economically advanced, technologically advanced. And I think we are definitely seeing a very different pace for science and technology and so we would also see it for science communication. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done to unlock the potential of science communication and public engagement. And I hope uh, organizations like FAST can support more thinking around this uh, and more you know, strategizing around, around this. And I hope this session, this session and the previous session has sparked some new ideas, some, you know, inspired you to do things differently or or, or you know, take actions in your own uh, sphere of influence. So I just want to thank everybody. I don't want to keep rambling on. Uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and, and thank you all for sharing your thoughts so generously, your insights and uh, experiences, and hope we can all stay uh, connected. The report, the, the SciComm Think Labs report, um, is uh, has been dropped in the chat. So please feel free to take a look at it and share your suggestions uh, for it. Uh, to, uh, to the fast ID. So thank you once again, and uh, please stay connected. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you to my fellow panelists. Yeah, bye bye. Bye, Vijay. Bye, Namrata. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.